And the neat part of that is yesterday, we just had a meeting with that same land manager, the same district ranger. And I thought I was meeting with one guy at the Forest Service. I think we had 12 or 14 forest people show up for this meeting because they knew who we were. They knew we were a great partner. They knew we get stuff done and that we're good, good listeners to the challenges they're facing. Welcome to Trail Effect. I am your host, Josh Blom. Trail Effect is a show that dives into the stories behind trails, the communities that embrace trails, and the people who rely on trails as a way of life. The goal of this show is to turn the stories you will hear from our guests into useful knowledge that can be applied to your community while providing some entertaining and inspirational content. Guests on Trail Effect include trail builders, board members, community leaders, volunteers, and regular people who really enjoy trails. For episode 163, we have Gary Moore, the Executive Director for Comba, Gil McCormack, the Trails Program Director for Comba, and Chris Wynn, the Marketing and Communications Manager for Comba. Comba is the Colorado Mountain Biking Association and is one of the oldest mountain bike organizations in the U.S. We packed a ton of great trail content into this conversation and I hope others can gain some valuable knowledge from this show. Cooley Creative is the title sponsor for this episode. They design and build custom websites as well as help companies with branding, photography, and e-commerce. Cooley Creative was started in Wisconsin, but is now based out of Bend, Oregon. Jared from Cooley Creative is a friend of mine. We've traveled together on multiple mountain bike trips, and sometimes he sends it. For more information about Cooley Creative, head on over to www.dojustsendit.com. Yes, that's right, www.dojustsendit will get you to the Cooley Creative website, so check it out. Kettle Mountain Apparel. As we are getting closer to spring here in the Northern Hemisphere, it is time to start thinking about buying some new riding gear for the season. Some of my personal favorites at Kettle Mountain Apparel are the Canyon Bibs paired with the Skidmark shorts and the Wayward Short Sleeve jersey. These are all super comfortable and functional articles of clothing that you can wear without looking like a superhero on your bike. Kettle Mountain Apparel also offers a lifetime guarantee on all of their products. By using the affiliate links found in the show notes or on the Trail Effect website, a small commission will come back to Trail Effect Podcast, which helps cover the expenses of keeping this show going. Now onto the Trail Effect with Gary Gill and Chris. Here we are today on Trail Effect. I have Comba, the Colorado Mountain Bike Association, with me, and that is comprised of Gary Moore, the Executive Director, Gil McCormick, the Trails Program Director, and Chris Wynn, the Marketing and Communications Manager, who all are located in the Front Range, but specifically, Gary, where are you located today? Uh, I'm in the Morrison area. How about you, Gil? Where are you at? I'm in Lakewood, Colorado. And Chris, are you in Oz or are you in uh, Colorado? And now I'm in Colorado. I'm in Golden. Nice. So you're all three located in different communities in the Front Range. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to throw this first one out to Gary. Let's get your backstory and why you got into trails and advocacy in this line of work. We talked a little bit before I hit record on how you came from the Southeast, but let's let's expand on that. Yeah, uh, my wife and I got back into, you know, what I call modern mountain biking in about 2010. You know, I grew up in uh, Southern California, San Diego area, and in the 70s, and we were throwing BMX handlebars on 10 speeds and riding down the canyons and taco and rims and breaking everything that there was to break. And ultimately wound up kind of getting away from cycling for a while. But we got back in to mountain biking around 2010 when our children were uh, were old enough to be left home alone for a while while we went out and recreated. Um, and I got involved with uh, Sorba Woodstock pretty much uh, as soon as we started riding their trails. Fortunately, there were some new projects going on in the Rope Mill area. We were building a new trail system there. So really just kind of all came in at once, fell in love with, uh, you know, newer bikes, more modern bikes and how much fun that was and purpose-built trails. What a difference that makes to the experience. And then, you know, starting to volunteer there and working with that group and just the enjoying the, the physical work. I'd been doing a lot of work. My professional job at the time was uh, in technology, kind of a jack of all trades for a small eBay-based business. 
And it was really fun just to get out in the woods and do something physical and, you know, build, build bridges, you know, make trails, fix trails, make features, just, you know, having that tangible thing to do out there and spend more time outside. And then just getting to see people enjoying that, knowing that the work that you're doing, benefiting so many people. We had uh, on that trail system, we probably saw 100,000 people a year on, on any given trail. And a lot of that work is going to be there for generations, you know, and, and so it really was something that that lit a fire with me. I had not been a volunteer up to that point. And it was just that combination of enjoying being outside and and building these experiences and seeing people just absolutely, you know, enjoy that stuff really kind of hooked me. And then uh, it, it came along at a time when I was ready to to change what I was doing for a living, um, get at, out of the corporate world and into something that was more community based. And again, just just doubling down on on being able to create these experiences for other people to go out and enjoy that eventually led to uh, the opportunity here in Colorado to come and and lead the Colorado Mountain Bike Association as a full time job. So, I mean, it was a pinch yourself moment when we actually got the opportunity to uh, move to Colorado and pursue something that was, you know, so near and dear to us. Wow, that's a, that's a pretty incredible story. And so you moved there specifically for this role to, to where you're Yeah, at correct. Colorado. And I was, I was our first full-time employee here in 2016. Gil, let's get your uh, story into the world of trails and combo. Yeah, well, it probably started with the first mountain bike in 1982, taking trips to Moab of all places on hardtail mountain bikes as you can imagine that was nutty back in those days and then that kind of morphed into getting into the family bike shop so i ended up in a bike shop in wheat ridge colorado for almost 30 years and right around 1991 this group out of lockheed martin reached out to us and said hey we're doing trail work down here on the colorado trail can you guys support us and and i of course was managing the shop. So I said, of course, we're going to support you. We mainly did financial support at the time, keep those guys going. And that was called Trail Conservation Services, which was really the first name for Comba back that long ago. We continued to support and over time, our shop got really involved in bicycle advocacy of any type. So whether it was bike rides or supporting races or Uh, My brother-in-law was a professional road racer, so when he retired, he came into the shop and we promoted a lot of pro racers here in Colorado. And somewhere around 2008, we realized that the bike industry was going a little flat. We had the mountain bike boom, and then we had kind of this road surge, uh, and we were starting to see all our customers were becoming middle-aged man and lycra, we call them mammals. We're like, okay, where are all the young people coming into the sport? So at that point, we're like, we got to get people on bikes again. Something's going on. And of course, we were a big supporter of Bicycle Colorado and in the work they're doing out here. But we decided we need to get kids on bikes. So that was my first initiative. So I moved more into bicycle advocacy at that point. And we heard about this little high school mountain bike program in California. And it was started really kind of supported by specialized bikes. So I went out to California, met with those guys and said, hey, we need this in Colorado. And we brought that program back to Colorado. And that's how the mountain bike program started. We were the first state to get the high school mountain bike league. Uh, That is now, of course, spread all over the, the country. So now we've got kids on bikes, right? Thousands and thousands of kids have gone through the program. I coached for nine years and we picked mountain bike cross country because it's the most accessible for kids. It's kind of easy to do in your backyard. You don't have to go to a resort. And from that point, we were looking at it and going, okay, road cycling is starting to die because of distracted drivers. And I did a ton of road you know, bike path advocacy work out here. And we got some stuff done, but it was really hard. It's just really hard to get infrastructure done. It's just, it's very expensive and there's not a lot of political will. So transition more to dirt because we were seeing more people want to get on mountain bikes. 
so we really got involved in, in mountain bike advocacy and that's where I got back more involved with Comba. They changed their name to Comba at that time. And, you know, really not a whole lot was going on at Comba. And that's when one guy who was with us, his name's Kurt, he said, we got to get an executive director who can run this thing and really expand the program. And that's when we hired Gary. Um, and since then, we've just exploded with trails projects and just we got a more more coming to get more people on bikes so yeah and that seems like a pretty pretty common theme of like we need to get this organizational functional we need to hire somebody right yes yep you're right and i and we're seeing more of that as and i and i have actually some questions related to that as we go along here but let's get chris's backstory because chris did not grow up in colorado at least i don't think and uh, that would be correct. Yeah. So I, uh, yeah, I mean, I grew up just outside of uh, Melbourne in Australia. Um, grew up in a, a small mountain range that was littered with trails. Um, so fortunate to grow up in a, excuse me, in an area that's, you know, conducive to, to riding mountain bikes, you know, and, and followed my older brother who was riding bikes everywhere. And eventually, you know, that, that turned into racing pretty quickly. Um, so I was captivated with, with cross country mountain bike racing. Started racing when I was 14, yeah, and, and, and really got after it. So, you know, got to the point where, you know, finished high school, finished college, but, you know, wanted to, to keep pursuing this, this racing dream and landed me over in Colorado. Um, and then my life kind of started to unfold from there. So, yeah, met my wife that first, first trip, kept coming back. Did eventually foray into road racing, um, so kind of left left the mountain bike world behind for, for quite some time, and actually switched to to racing on the road. And then, yeah, that that eventually started to wind up. Um, just got a little bit older, um, you know, had my first daughter and all that sort of stuff. And you know, from from there, fell into bicycle advocacy. So Gil mentioned uh, Bicycle Colorado before. Um, so that's our, our statewide advocacy organisation that that handles a lot of the the road and, and and tarmac advocacy, you know, street world. Um, so yeah, fell into to working for that organization, um, which was super refreshing, you know, like coming from from a racing world where, you know, performance is is really number one. You know, you're out there always thinking about, you know, trying to get faster, what race is coming up, you know, all, all those sorts of things. And you're kind of in this this small little bubble. So to kind of finish that up and then start working in advocacy, it really broadened, you know, my my horizons and broadened, you know, my perspective on, you know, what the bicycle can mean to people. Um, so it was super, super refreshing, super rewarding work. Um, but uh, yeah, and then, you know, certainly that that was a, a good, uh, you know, first foray into the working world, you know, coming from from racing bikes from a long time. Um, but it was kind of, yeah, you know, looking for, for opportunities, uh, you know, after that, and I got to know Gary and, and you know some of the work that was on on the mountain bike side, and um, opportunities arose, and yeah, found myself uh, over over the advocacy fence on the dirt side with, with Comber. So I've only been with the organisation for just not six months now. Yeah, well, it's an important role, you know, because especially the way people consume, I guess, anything today, you know, to have you know to, to have that marketing and communications director role for an organization, for any organization, whether it's a nonprofit, you know, or even a professional, you know, for-profit organization is a pretty critical role in today's world. So that's, a, that's, that's pretty awesome. Also let's get, and I was going to ask this to Gary, but I think Gil might be the better person to answer this next question just because he's been in Colorado the longest, but let's, let's dive a little bit deeper on the backstory of Comba and how it's evolved. You know, you kind of went into that a little bit, but we should go deeper on that because I think there's some things that people can take from that and Im implement in their own, or own organization and or just see some parallel lines. Well, and actually, I think Gary's got a good handle on it. I can just tell you from the beginning, I told you that story. Um, you know, just it starts with a few people who care and they start going out and working on the land. And from there, it was connecting with land managers and working uh, the trails according to their wishes and 
developing that relationship with the land managers and, you know, really providing a service that maybe they can't do or they need help with or they want volunteers. So it's very organic in how things start. But there does come that point where there's a greater need maybe than there's time or people or we need people that are completely focused on this. There's too many important decisions going on in a state or a community. And we need people at the table who are paying attention and who can do it in a professional way. So that was Comba's, you know, big shift is we had to take the risk, if you will, to say, you know what, we need a, a full-time staff to to manage this. And that's that's how we're going to get things done. There comes that point in the journey where as a volunteer, you just don't have the time unless you're retired. Yeah, I think every, everybody that's in any sort of nonprofit trail advocacy world has probably felt that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think you always feel like you're understaffed and, and you need more time. Our area, Gary could say more to this, but we have, I think it's 400, 500 tr- miles of trail that we're trying to pay attention to. And, and add to. And add to, yeah. And then all the land managers, you can imagine the cities, the counties, the state, the feds that are all in that. So all those relationships that are going on, Gary's very involved in keeping up with all those. And and they're always changing, right? They, they get promoted and a new guy comes in, a new gal comes in. So having uh, Gary at the helm to to just keep track of who's who is is part of our challenge. Those org charts are very complicated. Yeah, for sure. And that was actually going to be what I what I was going to ask ne- next. And this is definitely going to Gary. But let's talk about the region that Comba Services is, is maybe the best way of putting it or where you guys like geographically where your boundaries are, if there are any. Yeah, we're really central front range, um, despite the the uh, the Comba moniker. Um, we are not statewide. We we have partners that do what we do in Colorado Springs and Boulder, Fort Collins here in the front range. Um, so we we kind of work in between Boulder and, and Colorado Springs and then out to you know, Summit County, roughly the, the Continental Divide is our western boundary. And we try to do what we can with the communities here in the Denver metro area when it comes to establishing small bike parks and, and those kinds of projects. But we are really kind of central front range. The uh, the the joke that I always tell, you know, to explain Comba is that we really are the Denver Mountain Bike Bike Association or or organization, but nobody wants to be Dumbo. So we're we're gonna go with Comba for a while and see where that takes us. But it, it is a big area. That's one of our primary challenges. One of the things, you know, like Gil said, it, all these organizations always start and rely on volunteers. Um, in some communities, uh, the volunteers really can can make it work. You know, Sorba Woodstock was a group of of a dozen or so people that uh, over 20 years, it's still basically the same people that are in there doing that just on their own time. And, and like I said, some communities that works very, very well. Something like what we're dealing with, like Gil said, 500 miles of trails, 10 plus land managers, and just an amazing number of other uh, advocates and other partners, business partners. It's just a lot to stay on top of. And we saw pretty much straight away, it took me about a year and a half to get my feet on the ground here and to to really understand who the players were, where the trails were, what the problems were, what the challenges and opportunities were, and start to figure out what's it going to take to actually do what our mission is here in the area, which is, you know, essentially summed up with more trails and better trails, especially from a a mountain bike experience standpoint. So being able to to be here every day, all day, working on this, and you know, I'm seven and a half years into this role. So the the relationships that that really Gil and I and Chris has gotten involved in that now, cultivate and manage and and stay on top of is critical to to what we're doing and how we're doing it. And and I don't see you know, we would need so many more volunteers to be able to, you know, create that consistent and persistent presence here on just a variety of things. You know, that's that's something I'm sure we'll get into, you know, further into the conversation. But 
just being available to our land managers for their agenda, you know, or for other partners and, and what they're trying to accomplish and be there to represent mountain bikers and trail users, you know, as a whole is just super critical to, to having, you know, the ability to uh, represent the mountain bike community and to try to, to get some things accomplished that are on our agenda. Yeah. And I was looking at your website and from what I could tell, it appears that Comba is just focused on trails and trail advocacy. And what I mean by that is it doesn't look like you do any type of non-trail related events like races and whatnot. And have you found, I know some organizations lean, you know, lean into both avenues and then others. And the one that I use most notably is, is AMBC Knoxville as being just a trail organization. That's a really high performing trail organization. And they let race promoters do other events. Have you found that to be helpful in your arena to really stay laser focused on trails? Yeah, I think initially we say that about three quarters of our resources and efforts go into just trails, the the planning, advocacy, maintenance, construction, funding, the whole gamut of what it takes to to make great trail experiences for folks. Some organizations like ours do more in the way of what I would call social stuff, social rides, you know, happy hours, you know, more sort of club based activities where you're you're more directly involved in working with your members and, and your mountain bike community and your partners. Because we have such a challenge ahead of us, um, we're, we're making great strides. But with that many miles of trails and the opportunities to add the trail systems that we've been adding, uh, it's really taken our focus to do that and do it well. Um, the, the, other, the other 25% that you know I sort of leave open as other things that we do really is primarily our women's program. Um, which uh, is is something we're very proud of, what they've been able to create over there. Britt Foreman was a board member when I was hired, and she took this uh, on personally about seven years ago and grew this program to what it is today. And it's now run by uh, Drea Pescal, somebody that's that's very important to us as well. And that team, you know, they're they're putting on more than 20 events a year. They're reaching out to you know, women and BIPOC and Spanish speaking riders in the area, making really critical programs available to them in terms of maintenance classes, skills clinics, social rides, dig days with our trails team, and even some other social events like our gear swap days, where we try to, we try to keep some of that gear that uh, piles up in people's closets uh, more active and out of the landfills. So, you know, they're able to reach about 600, 800 riders a year, female riders, as well as the LGBTQ community. We have great representation within our our staff, within that community, and and we're able to lead some of those clinics entirely in Spanish for that community. So we're really excited about what we're able to do there. I would like to be able to get back to doing some beginner rider programs and some social programs to help people that are new to the area or new to mountain biking connect with other other riders and and it's tough you know when we're when we're in a community the size of denver we have half the state's population just shy of three million people uh our members and 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 community riders can live an hour plus away from each other and and they've got 500 miles of trails to choose from and it can be really difficult to find you know those people that ride when you ride how you ride where you ride and you know it can become that partner that we all like to have out there on the trails so we're we're really pleased with that we'd like to do more of that but we've really found that that where we can make the biggest impact is out on the trails and uh you know gills the tip of the spear for that for us just out there uh, nobody we couldn't ask for a better person somebody that knows you know this area so well and has the history knows every trail and every rock and every corner of every county it's really a valuable part of our team. Yeah, for sure. And Chris has been quiet and I want to make sure he gets included with this, with this, you know, from your perspective and like, what are some of the things that you're seeing that have been helpful on the communication side of things? Because, you know, like we'd already talked about, that is the way people consume, you know, where they get their knowledge from these days or like when something happening is, or when something is going on, like, what do you see on your front? Yeah, I mean, coming in certainly the last, you know, six months, um, you know, that 
there is this groundswell that's growing with with the Comba brand, you know, and thinking about the work that, you know, has happened in the last five years. I think it's been six bike only, you know, directional trails that the Comba has been able to achieve, which is which is huge, you know. So like this this whole groundswell, this this building wave of of some of the work that Comba's been doing has really helped to grow the brand awareness, um, which is I think one of the big challenges challenges, you know, thinking about um you know the reach we have in 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 the geographic area. Um, you know we can't necessarily always advertise our brand of trailheads, right? Um, you know there's thousands, you know tens of thousands of mountain bikers here in the front range, but what percentage of them actually know about Coimbra and the work that's done, and and who's behind? You know some of these fantastic trails that have that have opened up. So. You know, certainly as that wave, you know, keeps building and, and we are able to get more successes on the trail, you know, trail side of things, it's like for me, it's capitalizing on that and trying to reach those new audiences. Yeah. And you totally just spurred my brain on something that I forgot to bring up earlier and was going to ask about, which is the fact that you have 1,300 members and growing. Right. Yeah, I mean that's that's certainly a, a new challenge for us too, and um, and something maybe Gary w- wants to touch on. But you know, the last just 12 months, um, you know, was kind of a new era for, for Coimbra in the fact that we were previously an Imba chapter. But as of uh, March last year, Coimbra sort of fled the coop and, uh, yeah, decided to go out on its own. Um, so that required, you know, certainly retaining as mem- many members as possible from being an Imba chapter now to our own standalone program. And yeah, that's that's also been a challenge, at least for me, coming in into this new role is is reinvigorating that membership program, you know, and and trying to re-engage folks that uh, you know may have previously been with us and and may have lapsed in between in these last twelve months and getting folks back back involved. But um, you know, on on the plus side, you know, certainly you know we're in a position now that we can work stronger with the local community. Um, so you know, previously thinking about membership benefits and things like that i mean largely with with imba i mean that was controlled you know by by their um you know by by their devices um but now we can approach a lot of local community partners and that's one thing i've been doing in the last sort of six months is trying to build build that uh that membership benefit list but do so with with people who are supporting us here in our geographical area which is yeah which is really really meaningful work i think yeah and we're gonna go to trails now I don't know. We, I don't know if we get into the details first. If we go to, or if we go to places first, but I think I'm going to pick places first, and we're going to maybe pick one of the places that has came up on a couple of their podcasts recently, and that's why I'm picking this place. And it might be the furthest, furthest west place for you, but this is for Gil. Let's talk about Virginia, the Virginia Canyon Trail Project, because that one wasn't even on my radar until I met the McGills. We'll call them the McGills, even though none of them actually have the yeah. last name McGill. <laughs> But let's talk about how that that project is super intriguing because it's got a gondola in the mix too, and it's 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 just, just it there's just a lot happening with that one. It seems like, and and maybe it's the one that you guys are working on the most. I don't know. Um, I think it's no, I wouldn't say it's the only one we're working on. We have several projects in the some stage of of development. That one, I I would say Gary Gary should definitely pipe in on this, but I think we started about 15 years ago talking to the Idaho Springs, the city there, about putting some trails in the area. And of course, as you can imagine, many people cycled through the the government system there. And we just ended up at the right time in the right place because we had the relationship. I'd almost call Gary the mayor of Idaho Springs. Hmm. No. Let's Let's expand on that, Gary. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Well, no, Gary. Maybe a staffer out there, but... um... He's been yeah, there. It, it's, he leaves, and and then there's Gary. He's still there, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's been an interesting process. I got involved in it just after starting here, um, so it was probably spring 2017. And you know, it's in a project that long. There's a, a ton of people that have been involved in that, and that's always a challenge with these trail projects: is to you know, kind of include everybody give everybody their due but we've we've had so many people through the the stakeholder process and the planning process you know tony boone doing the the initial design for us and the master planning coming out and updating that master plan when we got some additional land available to us and you know just our our partners with colorado parks and wildlife have been have been super at helping us manage you know the concerns around bighorn sheep habitat 
we have some extreme uh, winter range up there for them. And, and the city is amazing. You know, the, it, it's a small town with a lot of things that they're trying to to manage and to handle and to grow and do better. We've seen uh, what, what Gil Scott are referring to is that there's really only myself and uh, the city administrator that have uh, been, you know, involved in the project, you know, for that last, this last episode or this last period here, last seven years of it. We've gotten, you know, a variety of city planners, you know, city council changes over, they were on our second mayor. And, and that just goes back to what we were saying before about being able to have that consistent presence. You know, the fact that Comba has had a consistent voice and presence in this project, you know, as we have, has been a big help to the city um, in terms of being able to guide them. We, we're, we're pretty proud of what we've been able to assemble here in terms of experience and acumen uh, and resources for these projects. Trail building, you know, starts with a concept, whether it's ours or the land manager that, you know, initially has the idea for a trail or a trail system. And then just working that through, again, the stakeholder process, the, the wildlife and land management part of it, coming up with a plan, finding the resources for that plan, getting all the approvals, getting it to shovel ready. And then the hard part, which is the fundraising, a lot of times, finding the funds and the resources to go build these trails and, and hire great trail builders like Flowride and, and the McGills to go out and, and make these things actually happen. So. There, there's a ton of work, a ton of, of conversations. I, I tell people, I think I just talk pretty much all day long, every day. That's my main job is just to talk and, and type all day. But, you know, that, that particular project, we're super excited about finally moving some dirt on after all this time and, and seeing some trails come to life. But it's more than that. We really, you know, the vision that you know, we started with with Tony and and Gil helped make some adjustments as we got to actually moving dirt. And then the builders, you know, we refer to the builders all the time as our artists, you know, and they bring their particular paintbrush out and paint experiences the way that they see the land offering them up. So we really are enjoying having both of those crews out there. We wish that we had a little more funding at the moment where we could be working on more trails at the same time. But there's there's just so much that goes into that that you always feel like, you know, we're leaving a partner out or we're not remembering to include somebody in a conversation. But it, it really does take a village and it, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of every project's different. Some of them, you know, are down and dirty and they get done really fast. Others just there's a there's a lot of complications. And one of the things that I'm sure we'll talk about some more is just Colorado's public lands and and the challenges of trying to build trails here in a state like Colorado, as opposed to some, some others here in the States. Well, and you just illustrated a a point that I try to illustrate quite frequently, which is that you've been, you've been at this, not you specifically, but this project has been talked about and been in one stage or or another for 15 years. Yeah. I refer to as tactical patience. Yeah. There's something to be said about that. And in, in today's world of, you know, that instant, like we got to get this done and got to get that done. Like, we just have to some back sometimes like remember that there's a lot of different people that have to have, you know, a say in it, or, you know, it's got to go through a big process, you know, and I'm glad that I chose to bring that one up because you could illustrate that this is a 15 year process to even move dirt. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, we, we shed, we, we weeped when we moved our first dirt up there. Um, it, it was it was an exciting day, and that was just on the uphill climbing trail, right? Now that we're actually building the downhill experiences, we're we're giddy. Yeah, you know, and it is. It, it's so much the the harder part of the story to tell, and it's one of the reasons that we've brought Chris on board. You know, one of the one of the challenges that we've kind of uh, put on his table is just try to how to bring people in more to a little bit of that how the sausage is made you know, uh, what's, what's going on behind the curtain. And nobody wants to hear that I was in another meeting today, you know, or that, you know, we had a great potential first meeting with somebody that may be a funder or that we've stumbled across some locals uh, or they found us some locals that want to get involved and volunteer and build. What they want to know is when is the trail open and when can I ride it? That's what we all want to know, right? When's, when's the new dirt and when can I put rubber on it? But there's so much of, of the machine that we're building here at Comba and have built over 
over the, you know, again, the last seven or eight years in particular, that is is harder to bring people into and get them excited about and get them to support that work, whether it's as a member or just as a donor or as a volunteer or as a business partner, uh, a potential, you know, bigger funder like that. We get a lot of money from the state trails program through CPW and Great Outdoors Colorado is a big part of how we're able to do a lot of this work. And a, and a lot of that is the planning, right? Just doing the the figuring out where the trails are going to go, and is that you know in impacting habitat in a way that we you know need to avoid, and, and coming up with those great plans that again you know balance all those needs of conservation and recreation, keeping Colorado the way that we love Colorado, and and still allowing ourselves to enjoy it. Again, when we go to raise money and say, hey, we're going to build a trail this summer, and we need some cash. People get involved in that. If we if we say we're we're going to launch an eight year effort to go you know get to shovel ready somewhere, it's it's a little less tangible for people. Well, and Gil just threw something over in the messaging that I was going to ask anyways because I'm yeah. from Wisconsin, so I have to ask this question selfishly. Trek's involvement, Trek bikes, you know they've they've been quietly, and I'm going to say quietly because it is pretty quiet. They've been quietly you know funding projects across the country. You know, they share our same vision that we need places to go to ride bikes. And it takes it takes a village to get that to happen. And part of it is financial. And, you know, John Burke has has created a foundation to support really good trail projects. So when we I think a year ago we were it was literally about a year ago, we were running out of opportunities for funding for this project and we called up Trek and said, hey, we didn't even know about the foundation. We're like, hey, can you help us out here? We we need some funding to, to get this trail going. And and of course, they got really excited and, and accepted our project. And it's just been a great relationship. They're very involved and love what we're doing. And, and they see the vision that we see. Yeah, they they really they came in at a really key time for us. We had had gotten to you know working with the city of Idaho Springs. We had gotten grants from uh, both CPW and from GoCo, and it just wasn't quite enough to get to that next phase of uh, of trail building, the, the start the start of the downhill bike only trails. And, and that's when Trek Foundation came along and had that last bit of funding for us that got us to a, a, an amount of work that we could actually put together in an RFP and put out to trail builders and, and get to move in dirt. So uh, very appreciative of their, of their support and partnership. It is officially the Trek trails at Virginia Canyon mountain park, a, a very key partner that came along at a very key time. You know, this a trail system like this, and we're seeing these costs kind of going up year over year, but we're, we're trying to build an initial, uh, what Gil about 10 miles of trails or so for $1.4 million. And we have an opportunity, uh, hopefully, to add even more to that and potentially double that cost. So that that becomes a very major challenge. Is you know the the project is shovel ready, the land is there, the builders are out there. All we need is the funding to keep that going and to finish building that park in the next couple of build seasons. Is our goal is to have that completely done here the next three summers or so. Yeah, Josh, I'd I'd like to just throw a shout out to my father in law because he he's who mm-hmm. I. For years and hoping years. you would at we were at cycler and right before he passed away he 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 reached out to john burke personally in a video which is hysterical because they john burke's uh you know obviously a global company now but he his first job for trek was the trek rep in colorado and so he went to to my father-in-law eugene kefel school of bike business and John never forgets it. Eugene taught him a lot. So when Eugene sent him a video and said, hey, John, you need to support these trails out here. And if you don't, I'm going to come up there and kick your butt. (laughs) John laughed and said, "Okay, we got to do this. That's awesome. It was about exactly a year ago that I had Bob Bob Burns on this podcast, you know, and Bob is, you know, the person behind the the Trek Foundation and who's, you know, who's their key advocacy person now. And so it was, it was pretty awesome to have, have Bob Burns on knowing how involved he is with just advocacy in general and how, and that's why I say they're pretty quiet about it because there's not 
you, you didn't, you just said you didn't know that there's a Trek foundation. You know, being in the bike industry for so long, there's people for bikes and there's other organizations, but we're not seeing, uh, you know, the funding is really the issue for getting a lot of these projects to go and having the bike industry have a big enough vision to say, you know, let's leave a legacy of trails where people can enjoy for, you know, decades, if not centuries. So having that mindset in the bike industry not only will increase their sales, but it also is a great way to, a, a really tangible way to give back to a community. Yeah. And one of the first, the first project I went on in my current role outside of, in, in my professional role is, was a Trek Trails project and it was flagging trails for a Trek Trails project in Northern Wisconsin. You know, it's mm-hmm. Trek, Trek Trails yes. at Telmark Lodge. Yep. Or yep. Mount Telmark. Yeah. Joe Von Bunker. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I was with Joe that week. You know, and I've had I've had Joe on the podcast a couple times now. Yeah, no, he gets it. I and I think it's great. great Trek gets it. I I would like to encourage more industry mm-hmm. people to start thinking that putting money into trails. I mean, it's really a cheap date. I mean, a, a mile of of sidewalk or bike path is is at least a million dollars. Okay, is- so make that comparison to a million dollars going into trails. Oh, for sure. For sure. And I mean, we're seeing it now and it's, it's, I think it's more of a, a new thing, but now land managers, but more specifically communities such as park and, and parks and recs departments are looking at trails more similarly to air comparing them to like ball fields and stuff like that. Finally, you know, whereas like it wasn't, you didn't think much about dropping a couple million dollars into a sports complex, right? Right. That serves its purpose, but also you see it empty a lot. Right. Well, and Chris well the maintenance it. and upkeep of those is is incredible. You know, there there's more communities pulling those out than are putting them in. I think. Well, you know, Chris, maybe you can share what went on in the in your hometown, but it seems like maybe you've seen this in Colorado or at least in the Front Range. There's quite a bit of resistance here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think. Well, as as it was alluded to before, I mean, there's just so many stakeholders in, involved, you know, in any project. Um, so, you know, whether it's conservation or, or just different recreation groups, you know, like that's generally this big melting pot that that takes takes time, takes resources, and and you know, as as Gary mentioned before, as these projects you know go on, things generally tend to get more expensive. Um, I've got something for you, Gil. I've- when it comes to operating in your role, what yeah. is what are the some of the things that you've you've picked up on that have maybe presented themselves, you know, that you didn't maybe know coming into this role? And a couple of the the two topics I'm going to hit on within that would be like the purpose of directional trails and how they've been helpful, along with like managing different user types. Well, here in Colorado, you know, the mindset is to use multi direction. It has taken, I mean, even land managers would tell you, they'd say, yeah, it makes sense. You know, we should have directional trails. Uh, We should have, you know, single use trails. But it's really hard to get that on the ground. Part of that is the wildlife issue. You know, we don't want more trails necessarily. And I don't know, it's a Colorado thing. I I don't know what that is. But we are getting some breakthrough here and there to think about, you know, the speed issue is probably the biggest barrier, right? You know, mountain bikers are going too fast. And we've worked with, well, one great example, Gary probably has others, but I'm thinking of Jefferson County open space, which is which is a, a leading open space in, in the nation. And they've worked with us to get directional trails at certain times of the week, which is pretty cool. Given the millions, they they estimate over 7 million visitors a year, right? So with all those people coming, we're able to put in some ideas on how to do this differently so that everybody has a great experience. Yeah. And you also have some gravity trails. How is that process to get, to get those uh, implemented? Well, our greatest gravity trails would be at our, you know, our ski areas in the summer. I would say... Our big foray, and Gary could speak more to this, was uh, a little open space up in Clear Creek County. And through a lot of work and a lot of time, we were able to 
put in a directional trail, really the first directional trail in the Front Range. First purpose-built bike-only directional trail, yeah. Downhill. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the key for some of those, the successes has come in the, the new trail systems where we're able to start with a clean sheet. You know, as Gil was saying, when you're looking at a very busy open space that already has 200 miles of trails, 7 million visitors, and they've been multi-use and bi-directional forever, going in and making a rules change is a very difficult thing to do. They've made some very good choices in the last few years in terms of certain segments being converted to directional or, you know, designated use by day of the week, that kind of thing. But that's that's about as much as you're going to get typically when when a system's already established and been in place for as long. So when we look at you know the three new trail systems that we've been able to to bring to bear, or two plus the one we're building now, uh, Floyd Hill, Maryland Mountain uh, were completely clean sheet designs, and so we were able to go in and and share our experience uh, with those uh, land managers in terms of what what you can gain by separation by speed, designated use, directional travel, ways of making the experience better for everyone. So with something like the Sluice or the the three downhill trails in Maryland Mountain and Blackhawk, a a lot of that was also including hiking only options, right? So not only are we trying to manage, you know, green to double black types of experiences, but also trying to create those specific experiences for hikers that balance out a trail system, make it so that it's something that a a land manager can be proud of and know that people are going to come and enjoy without a lot of conflict, you know, and and really the the primary conflict, like Gil said, is when bikes turn around and come downhill. That that's when we really become an outlier. Uh we're going instead of everybody going roughly the same speed uphill, now we're going, you know, what, 10 times faster downhill. And that's where those conflicts come in. And and really for mountain bikers, you know, a lot of people enjoy the climb. We're, we're not saying there's anything wrong with getting your getting your fitness and going uphill. But, you know, it's it's harder to find that opportunity to point the bike downhill and just let it rip and know that it's about you and your bike and your skill level and your courage and your competence and, you know, managing your own risk and not being worried about coming around a corner and, and there being a dog or a family or uh, in some cases a horse. You know, the, those kinds of situations are what we're trying to avoid. And, and so when we create a trail system that has these specific routes for bikes to come downhill on, the whole system just mellows out. You know, we don't need a lot of instructions and and warnings to people and and encouraging them to to get along with each other. The system just works best that way. You know, Floyd Hill came together in a way that it really just kind of has a natural circulation. People all go up the same way and and hikers come down one way and bikes come down another or rinse and repeat. And it's just so much more pleasant for everybody. And and with directional trails, you you get rid of a lot of those problems of traffic that comes at each other. And how you have to step off the trail and the way people do that is either either correctly or not. And so you run into trail widening and, and resource damage that isn't necessary and can be avoided just by by some simple management rules. So we've we've been pushing pretty hard on that the last five or six years and, and seeing some success. That's good because I push on that pretty hard through this podcast. Mm-hmm. I, I was just going to say we might be preaching to the choir here. We're, we're re-educating a lot of land managers, and some get it, some love it. But if you're not a mountain biker, I, it's really hard to understand what we're talking about because it's not just, you know, managing people and speed. It's, it's experience, right? Everybody's going out there for an experience. And if we put, you know, car in the same lane coming at us, it doesn't work, right? We know that elsewhere. We're just not to a point. I feel like yet maybe the next generation will come in who are our mountain bikers who can start thinking in those terms. Gil created the, uh, I'm going to give you credit for this, Gil. I think you you came up with this originally, but the when we're managing these trail systems, we have the four Ps, and that is people, parking, politics, and poop. I was wondering if poop was going to be in the mix because that's always in the yeah. mix. No, it is. <laughs> it's amazing how often we get drawn into the conversation around 
uh, both dog and human waste <laughs> and, and our ability to help manage that in some way or another. And, it, and really, a lot of it does boil down to managing those four things. Yeah, that's good. Forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, and I've I've used the analogy, and this is really extreme, but it works. Could you imagine if people went golfing at each other? Right, right, right. You know, you have those funny videos on YouTube about the Europeans laughing at us that we don't have directional or, you know, single use trails. They're like, you guys are crazy over there in the U.S. Yeah. I mean, the the guest that's the show that's going to come out just before your show that isn't live yet, uh, but will be live by the time this is live, is David Davis. Mm. He's out of Wales. And he created the original Ride Center concept in 1994. In wow. He tells the story about why he created it and how he came, how it came to be, and that was a that was a Tony Boone connection because Tony's good at yeah, connecting well, a lot of people. But like, oh yeah, yeah. we had the there's like, a lot of nodes coming off of Tony. Oh yeah, yeah, we had the conversation. I just recorded this two days ago, three days ago. He he developed that in '94, so that's 30 years ago. Yeah, and we literally could have the same conversation today as if it was brand new. Yeah, and I I think it's. Chris, what have you seen like in your home country? What is it? Hey, everything's got to be multi-use or do they understand it differently? No, I mean, when I grew up and, and started mountain biking, which was, you know, late late 90s into early 2000s and, and onwards, I mean, no, there was, especially in my area, um, you know, there was nothing, nothing that was directional only. Um, it was very much shared multi-use trails with with hikers and and you know maybe there were specific rules around equestrian and things like that but no it was really really fair fair game um but you know to to see how at least places in australia have evolved over the last five or so years you know talking about tasmania and, and different trail projects that are popping up and just just you know leaps and bounds i think from when i first you know got into mountain biking i think it was just hey there's a trail let's let's give it a rip and away we go and just to see see that growth back home um is, is actually really neat you know i think there's still a place for a multi-use bi-directional um it's it's certainly the best bang for your buck if you're a land manager and you have a certain number of acres that you can dedicate to a trail system you're you're getting the most trail for the most people by doing that but you know in an as you get to a busier and busier area like we have here in the front range, the idea that you're going to you know, turn 7 million people loose on 200 miles of trails that are all multi-use and bi-directional and, and then wag your finger and say, now you all behave and be nice to each other. It just sort of doesn't, doesn't give uh, credence to human behavior enough. So that's, that's really what we're trying to manage here in the front range is there are so many people that want to be outside something like 80% or so of, of, of Denverites self-identify as outdoor recreationists that try to get out a couple of times a month to do it however they like to do it. And it just becomes really difficult to have everything be sort of, you know, you all be nice to each other. I think if we can build in specific experiences, build in some sort of intrinsic you know, flow and opportunity for certain types of uh, recreation that ultimately it just goes smoother for everybody. And maybe there's not as many miles available to each different trail user group uh, or visitor group, but ultimately there it's more quality time. It's more quality miles if you're able to put in some of these management techniques. Yeah, that's a super important aspect is the quality uh, quality over quantity aspect of this. I think everybody would agree that, you know, I'd rather have a really high quality trail that I ride a whole bunch of times because I can do laps on it. Right. You know, versus just a spaghetti mess of mediocre trail. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, so we're talking trails. So we're going to get into the strike force thing. Oh, because you have 500 miles of trail to manage. And I'm assuming that's why the strike force came to be. Well, you, you nailed it. I mean, we, Gary and I were we're trying to get this done with volunteers and, and, and we have great volunteers. In fact, we have some volunteers that will put in over a thousand hours a year, just, just because they want to help. But that's not, you know, there's not a lot of those around and, and retired people typically, retired people mainly, but, 
but how do you how do you get this work done efficiently? And that was our big quandary. So trying to get done volunteers was was fun, and we still do that. It's, we have great volunteers, but we needed more. And so that's when we cooked up this idea of you know let's just hire our own team and go out there and knock it out. Yeah, yeah, and that's I've volunteers. It's it's how we all started. Yep. And so it's a component that we need to keep as a very important component. But at the same time, if we can have people doing stuff while we're working, mm-hmm. you know, then you get more stuff done. Well, and you think about it, you get you get employees now they have a job. They know what they got to do. They get trained. They get strong. You're just going to get more work done more efficiently than a volunteer group. Our volunteer groups may be different from others. We we push them pretty hard. I mean, we go out and we work hard. And you know, we're we we actually at one point had a group called the SWAT team. They're the Shape Wonderful Optimized Trails was what we called them. And it was a, you know, it was an elite group. We, we kind of laughed as a SWAT team six. And this was a few guys who never took lunch, never sat down and they just moved rocks and did really hard, fast work. And that may have been the birth of the, of the strike force. How was the strike force set up? Just maybe, and I, I asked this as, you know, if there's another, you know, club or organization looking at getting into this for the same reasons you guys did, like, how do you, how do you manage it? I know it's going to be a little bit different for every community because you're, you're dealing with different land managers and do, and working in the mountains is going to be a lot different than say working in, you know, a, a trail system adjacent to an urban area that has 200 feet elevation. Right. But generally speaking, like, how did you, how do you model that strike, for, strike force or how did you set it up? Well, I'll talk about the the structure of strike force and maybe Gary can talk about the financials of strike force. Really, it was hiring a really strong team. We, one of our interview questions is still tell me something really hard that you've done in your life. And if the story is not good enough, they're, they're put down on the list of, of not probably going to make the job. Right. It really is a little, I, I always couch it as CrossFit trail work. And that's that's the level of people we're looking for. And the other piece of that is pay them really well. So when you're trying to get good people, a lot of land managers around us right now are looking for trail work people and they don't pay them enough. So guess what? They're not the board. <laughs> yeah. It, it really is an important program. And, and you know, it, we're seeing a lot of other organizations like us that are reaching for this and finding the funding and, and trying to stand it up. Um, the, the biggest challenge is that it's a seasonal effort uh, in, I would think, just about anywhere in the country. But particularly here in Colorado, where, you know, May to October is kind of the, the sweet spot for us. And then there's just certain times of the year when there's not much we can do out there. And so trying to put together a program like Gil describes where you get the right people and you create the right culture in that team. One of the things that I've been most impressed with is just their ability to, to create a team that these guys are making lifelong connections. They're going to be friends forever, just spending one summer together. Uh, But trying to, to put that together in a way where we get as many of those back the next year is super important where we're not trying to, to reteach them how to do the work or get them back in shape potentially and get to doing work faster. You know, volunteers will always be the backbone of, of what we do. We do a lot of work with our corporate partners and getting those team building days and those community give back days. And, and we're super thankful for those efforts. But, you know, it's going to be the one and only time a lot of those people ever do anything like that. And and there's just limits on what the body can do. And, and you know, trail building is, a, is an art and a science. And, and even when you're just doing maintenance, there is still a lot of sculpting and crafting and knowledge that has to go into doing that properly. So we, we kind of break that up where, you know, we have the, the rank and file, they come out once or twice a year volunteers and, and kind of do the drain clearing, you know, level of, you know, getting rid of, we have a lot of uh, uh, cobble kind of here in Colorado that always seems to come to the surface. And we just rake a lot of times we're just raking rocks. But then you kind of build up to the volunteers that, that have that experience and have done a lot and can be crew leaders, can work with land managers on designing solutions to problems and leading the teams and getting that work done. Um, but then we really just needed to have a force multiplier there and have a group that was going to go out 
work 40 hours a week for, you know, 18, 20, 24 hours, 24 weeks a year and finding the funding for that. For us, it's been, you know, 150 to $200,000 a year to run that crew um, and finding that funding uh, has been uh, with with our partners at GoCo the first year and then CPW State Trails Program the last three years. We just found out yesterday that we got our grant for this summer, which we're super excited about and, and thankful for. But one of the changes that we're trying to make and, and Colorado Parks and Wildlife, CPW, their state trails program has recognized the, this challenge of this seasonal activity and the fact that this is something that's got to happen every year. You know, coma is going to be here every year. The trails are going to be here every year. The weather is going to be here every year. Wear and tear on, the, on all those millions of visitors getting out there is there every year. So why are we approaching this on a on a year by year basis and and help us put together, you know, contracts and and funding that are at least two or three years, if not longer, to be able to know that we're going to have this program and we can guarantee people work for more than just one season, right? So that's those are kind of some of the lessons that we've been working through the last three or four years, trying to educate our partners and our funders on on what it takes to make this work. You look across the state and the, the numbers are staggering. And we were we see estimates in the 30 to 50 million dollar range for uh, deferred maintenance, particularly with our federal land managers. That's one of our big challenges in Colorado is is the BLM and Forest Service control or own, operate most of our public lands in the state. And they're horribly underfunded, horribly, horribly underfunded. And and so it it takes groups like ours, it takes programs through the state to attack those problems and and to try to find the partnerships and the resources to sort of keep our trails from washing away and, and making sure that it's a safe and enjoyable experience for everybody when they get out there. So uh, like I said, there there's a number of organizations just in Colorado I'm aware of that are doing exactly the same thing. We we work together and and share job descriptions and and you know tips and tricks and and lessons learned on on these things. We're all kind of feeling our way through this together, but it, it's definitely something that I don't see how we could be effective without. You continually bring up partnerships, and there's one partnership that stuck out to me when when you communicated some topics uh, a couple weeks ago, and that is Outside 285. Mm-hmm. What is Outside 285? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that started originally with uh, a federal land manager coming to us and saying, we simply don't have the resources to have all these meetings and all these conversations with every advocacy and recreation group out there. Can you guys take the lead as COMBA? And, you know, do that work for us. Go out and talk to all your fellow recreational advocates. What are the needs? What are the hopes? What are the dreams? Bring together a five to 10 year plan on what you see as the projects and things that we should be pursuing in our in our ranger district. So that started off very grassroots. We were doing that with, you know, three or four of us in the back of a library with colored pens and sheets of paper and maps and and trying to have those those outreach to hikers and equestrians and trail runners, which can be very difficult. They're they're not as organized. You know, equestrians probably have, you know, a dozen groups that are working in the same area we are. Uh, hikers are really just not organized at all. And there's a there's a couple of good runner, you know, partners that we're able to work with. So we just kind of, you know, at the very genesis of that, that was the plan was, can we just get the recreational voices together and all have one set of asks that can be reviewed and, and considered by the, the district ranger? That outside we finally two, were able to get, go ahead. I was going to say outside 285, really, it did come from grassroots, but then it, we realized this thing was way over our heads as far as managing it. and and really. In our state, it was the wildlife folks that really needed to make the decision on where, as Gary would say, tell me where not to put a trail. I'll just mm-hmm. do that. And that was really the question. So it ended up we needed a consultant. We needed a planning grant. We needed uh, people at the table that love wildlife and remote places with no people. And uh, we got everybody we could together as stakeholders to make these decisions on where not to put a trail 
which again was was another grant, right? We had to go out and get a planning grant from the state trails program and and able to hire. Um, I'm glad to be able to work him in. He's one of our key partners, um, Bill Mangle with ERO Resources, as well as a couple of key people that that he works with, uh, Mimi Mathers and uh, with Coyote Clan and and some other folks there in the ER Resources office, but. They, you know, Bill is able to come in and bring in a unique set of skills in terms of facilitation. Uh, he understands environmental analysis and and you know what we call NEPA and SHPO work, um, which is is just all that that considers the landscape and what it needs and the animals that live there and what they need, and, and just organize this conversation. So we we were able to put together that outside two eighty five steering committee. Um, I think at the time we probably had 20 or so stakeholders in that group, anybody from, you know, very uh, other specific concerns like wild turkey and trout and those, you know, to more recreational interests, uh, working with all of what we call the ologists in the area that can help us navigate, you know, where the animals are and where they need to be and how they need to be protected to thrive. And that's grown into one of the, the regional partnerships now. Uh, here in the state. It's another initiative from Colorado Parks and Wildlife are creating these regional partnerships that we just are are instituting and keeping those groups working together year in and year out. Let's bring all the voices to a table. We now have 34 stakeholders, I think, within Outside 285 that get together and either just have, you know, broad general conversations about a region. There's limited land here. There's limited resources. There's places that are are still untouched by humans and are great habitat. There's places that are heavily impacted by humans. And can we concentrate and make more capacity for recreation in those areas? But it's Colorado is a challenging place. There, there is a lot to love here. There's a lot to protect and preserve and conserve. And mountain bikers are conservationists at heart. We love to, to see what's out there and what, what continues to thrive. I, I love being able to see elk and moose on a ride. You know, mountain lion and bear can be a little different you know, experience for folks. But, you know, we want to see that stuff out there, too. And, and even though the the tread is our experience and and the reason that we're out there, we're very much interested in doing that responsibly. And what we have found is that we've been able to make a lot of progress, both on conservation and recreation, by leading those conversations, bringing those people together, finding the resources to stand up. Um, everything that we need to have those productive conversations and create those maps and trail plans and, and really just, you know, get to the point, like Gil said, where where should we not be? And and let's, you know, figure out what that means in terms of where we can be. But doing it in that order means that we're we're keeping our priorities straight and we're thinking of wildlife, uh, habitat and and Colorado's natural beauty first, and then figuring out how to enjoy it responsibly second. That's good. I, I I'd like to add just you know it all it all starts with maintenance, Josh. So our land managers were saying, you know, you want more trails? Why don't you maintain the ones you have? You probably have heard that before. And, and it really took years of building that trust that yeah, we're actually going to go out there and and do the work to maintain these trails that we already have. And it really we're t- still playing with our current toys. We're not just asking for new ones. Right. And that helped them go, OK, you guys seem to be a consistent, trusted partner. Let's let's now we can talk. Yeah, that is super important. I mean, it's I've used the analogy of a house like do you fix the kitchen before you put a hot tub in? <laughs> 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 you know, it's it's all maybe. It, yeah, I guess it depends on where your priorities are. Hey, we got to go. We got to go back to Chris. Chris is being Chris is Chris is being super quiet. Well, it's 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 more Josh that I just you know fortunate to have such a wealth of experience between Gil and Gary and you know the the work projects and everything that they've got um, you know from their their time at Comba. So yeah, I mean only being six months into into this role, there's a lot that I'm still learning. And um, yeah, even just hearing them talk today and just talk about different projects, you know, is is, is always you know beneficial for me to 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 understand you know where where this brand has come from or where it's going to chris you know uh, chris is really trying to do two main things for us one of them is he's trying to help us garner the support from the community that we need to to do our work and to grow our work 
that comes from the storytelling, the communication, the, you know, the community building is what we're, we're working on there. But yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and second part is just the community building. We, we're, we're in such a huge area. People are so dispersed. We don't have the, the benefit of a smaller community where, you know, it's very clear who the advocates for trails are in your area. It's very clear which businesses are benefiting from that. We can go into Blackhawk or Idaho Springs and create a trail system. And you know exactly who's going to benefit from that traffic, right? With Denver, that's tougher. Uh, I can't go to a bike shop or a a pizza joint and say, hey, help us build more trails because you're going to see more business. We just don't have that built in. And, and so really what we've asked Chris to do is to come in and and wrap his arms around those two issues. How do we garner more support from the community and how do we build a stronger community? Uh, that was that was part of bringing our membership program in-house is creating more direct ties between our members, the perks that we offer them for supporting us with the businesses that are supporting us as well and, and trying to and, you know, just kind of circle those wagons, close those gaps, bring people tighter and make us all feel a little more like we have a shared, a shared goal and, and shared success. I've got a funding question and this is just something that I've noticed and I'm just going to, I'm curious to see what you guys notice. And because you've talked about funding quite a bit and the challenges that come with it, but have you noticed a change in terms of willingness to fund projects once the planning and design and access has been secured and you know, it's actually going to happen versus like the abstract front end of, Hey, we want to do this over here. We just don't know what it looks like yet. Yeah. You know, I think there's some of that. Um, you know, like I said earlier, when we get to the point where something is shovel ready and we do a specific, let's say we do a bike sweepstakes, for example, to raise, you know, construction money. Yeah. People are much more willing to get involved at that point as the general public, the, some of our larger funding partners that are able to, to bring, you know, six figure checks to the table which again is primarily for, through grant programs, they uh, a lot of times are more interested in the planning. You know, they want to know that this is something that is being put together in a way that it's going to be responsible, it's going to be respectful, it's going to be successful, it's going to bring the kinds of experiences that that community needs and will benefit from. So a lot of times, you know, we get, uh, you know, most of our grants lately have been for planning and maintenance. And then when it comes to construction, we're we're having to get creative in other ways. I, I'd, I'd add to that that, you know, we talked about strike force and we talked about outside 285 and, and part of outside 285 is, is some pretty heavy lifting maintenance. And so that's where the strike force comes in with a machine or a hand crew in the backcountry to fix just problems that, that the land manager has even before we can get new trails. But I have, you know, I, I track, I think we have over 50 just different projects we're working on, uh, trail systems that, that I'm tracking. And in that, I, I know out of Outside 285, we had over 50 trails approved to build. And why aren't they built? You know, the, the, I think the challenge is the funding. You know, if we had the funding, we could be out there cranking stuff out. If people only knew. Uh, <laughs> What we have behind the scenes, um, they'd yeah. be. Sounds like that's. We've, we've uh, been able to grow to the point that we're we're raising and directing about a million dollars a year into our work, but we, you know, to Gil's point, we we see an easy ten million dollars that we could spend in the next couple of years. Um, some of that's planning and environmental work. Some of it's construction, but there is there is just a lot more out there that could be done. It's just you know, how do, where does that come from? Where do those resources come from? How do we how do we stack up the partners to get us to a point where we can get get some of that work done? And and it's a uh, it's it is our primary challenge. We we've got everything else, you know. We've got the relationships. We've got the acumen and experience. Um, what we what we lack usually is just the the dollars. Sounds like Chris has some stories to tell. No, I just, you know, thinking about it from a communication standpoint, you know, and, and, you know, that's, that's the challenge sometimes, you know, being a nonprofit and, and trying to get folks, you know, to have some, some level of buy-in to become a member or volunteer their time, you know, and, and to understand that trails just don't magically happen overnight, you know, and, and, you know, we're, we're trying to, 
tell that story and say, you know, these these are, you know, huge planning efforts and and huge amount of people power that goes behind projects like Trek Trails at Virginia Canyon Mountain Park or whatever it's been in the last, you know, five, six, ten years. But, you know, at the same time, folks can go out there and ride these experiences at no cost to them already, you know. So just to try and get that value proposition over the line to say, you know, we can do more with your support, become a member, you know. And, and you touched on, yeah, like the fact that we're only hovering around 1,300 members right now. Like a lot of people that I speak to are hugely surprised at that number. Um, but, you know, it's how really, low it is. Yeah, yeah, how low it is, exactly. So, you know, and and, and certainly, you know, the more people get involved, the more people either can volunteer or, or become financially supporting, the more we can do, the more experiences and better experiences are going to be out there. Um, and that's certainly, you know, on top of my mind every day coming into this job is is having those conversations, whether it's with, you know, potential business partners or even just grassroots riders, you know, and, and you know, partnering with with local riding groups and and, you know, just bringing the conversation of of being a bike advocate to the forefront, you know, and, and thinking about, you know, folks might buy their lift pass for the year and at the same time they should be renewing their their, their local organisation membership as well, you know, and giving back to the trails. And, you know, I think internally because we're in this work, you know, we'd like to think that, you know, 10,000 hours plus of trail maintenance I think we did last year and, you know, the, the six bike-only directional trails that have been open in the last five years, I mean, those are, are certainly huge reasons in our mind to want to join an organization like Comba. But for some people, it it may be the, the T-shirt or the 10% off or whatever it might be. And, and just finding that balance of whatever resonates with that particular person, whether they just, you know, really just intrinsically want to give back to the trails and understand that it's a big lift and a big process. Or is it the flip side? Is it some sort of membership perk that sparks them to say, yeah, I'm going to give my, you know, $39 a year to become part of this organization so I can get all these benefits. That's really the challenge, you know, but but the overarching theme above every, everything is, you know, the more support we have, the more the more we can do, you know. So it's, it's really, as I said, on, on top of my mind every day, whether it's in our communications that we're putting out or just conversations that we're having, you know, organically on the trail. I mean, gee, the amount of times that I turn up to trailheads now, you know, especially in this new role and just think about everyone I see on the trail, you know, do you know who Comber is? Are you a member? You know, like those are the first things that, that that come to my mind, you know, and I think, yeah, we're all in this together, you know, and that's another thing that, um, you know, working with whether it's manufacturing partners, whether it's retail partners or organisations like ours, you know, thinking about, well, if you're making the bikes, you need somewhere to sell them. And if you're selling the bikes, you need somewhere to, to ride them and have those experiences, um, you know, and we're all in this this big loop. Um, and the more we can support each other, the stronger we all become. Um, so, you know, telling those stories, getting that communication across is, yeah, is, is, is vitally important just to keep growing. Excited to see what Chris brings to the table. I'll tell you, it's it's the message he probably been one of our weakest places i you know i've been just in the dirt literally for so long that you know we do want more trails and better trails but those two really go together we're looking for trails that offer a better experience for mountain bikers so a lot of our work early on especially was just taking legacy trails that were maybe even 100 years old and redoing them so that they are more optimized for bikes and the other part of better trails is we're in a project right now where it's a it's probably a 14 mile new system that we can't get funding for you know so here we are a great project can't get funding a part of that project though is the better trails aspect is to close some social trails that mm -hmm. are right through uh, riparian you know wildlife yeah. and so a lot of our work is to remind land managers that you know we're not just about just oh we want more trails more trails but we want to better experience not just for our bikes everybody and the wildlife mm -hmm. so when we were in the this outside 285 early beginnings you know they were pretty mad at us because we kept coming to them hey how about this trail you know and the next year hey how about this trail? so so at one point the the district ranger was pretty heated and said get out of here until you you know as gary told the story 
And the neat part of that is yesterday, we just had a meeting with that same land manager, the same district ranger. And I thought I was meeting with one guy at the Forest Service. I think we had 12 or 14 forest people show up for this meeting because they knew who we were. They knew we were a great partner. They knew we get stuff done and that we're good, good listeners to the challenges they're facing. Pretty cool. Yeah. That's a good we, we really do try to take a stance of, of getting as many voices in the conversation as possible and listening as much as possible at the beginning of that. Uh, I just, it's been on a personal level, it's been fascinating just to learn, you know, more about the wildlife in Colorado and what they need and how they behave and what the, what the human impacts look like for them and, and how to be part of that conversation. So, you know, we, we do try to start off with listening and then work towards solutions that, that accomplish as many goals as is reasonable. That's a really good life lesson right there, Gary. <laughs> Well, I think that's a good, I think that's a good place for me to transition into, uh, I guess you could say one of the fan favorite questions. I'm going to have each of you answer this question individually, and I want you to answer it as selfishly as possible as well. Okay. Which is, and we'll start with Chris. I don't think any of the three of us are very good at that, but we'll try. We're going to, we're going to start with Chris. Right. Say you had to move to a different community, Chris, because you couldn't be where you are now. What are some of the things you would look for in terms of amenities in that community that would draw you in? You know, I think it always goes back to my roots of where I grew up, you know, and, and growing up in a small mountain range. You know, it's something that really has shaped where I'd like to be, you know, and, and here living now in Golden, Colorado, it's the most kind of urban place that I've lived, you know, like in, in, in my life. So, you know, community for me, if, if, if it's out of a major city, if, you know, there's there's access to open space and recreation opportunities, then, yeah, that's that's really something important to me. And, and you know, certainly here, you know, in Golden, I'm right on the fringe of that. Um, but, uh, you know, moving to another community would have to have ease, ease of access to the outdoors and, and obviously riding experiences. It's what, I, it's what I've always done and will continue to do. So that's always top of mind. How about you, Gil? How are you going to answer that one? You have to, you have to leave Wheat Ridge, Colorado, which you've probably been your whole life, and go anywhere else. Yeah, I was born here in Colorado, so you know, I, I if I had to, you know, I may not have a choice on some of this, but I would find really good people. I think having a good community of people around is number one. And then, as far as personal endeavors, I've always been an outdoor athlete, so mountaineering, rock climbing water sports, frozen water, and, and mountain biking. So it, it'd be tough to find the perfect place. If, if I got to choose, Josh, that's harder, I think, than being told, no, you got to move here. I would make the best of what I could find for sure. Yeah, no, I would, I would definitely find a place with great people and, and, uh, and then having access, easy, quick access to, to all the things I love to do in the outdoors. And Gary and Chris would have to come along with me. Oh. <laughs> so it looks like you guys are going wherever Gil's going. <laughs> <laughs> we, we usually do. <laughs> so, so Gary, where's Gil taking you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I wish I had that magic answer of that perfect community that we could all go. Uh, well, Gil and I would retire. Chris has got a little ways to go. You know, I, I think it's really just a combination uh, of what the two of them said. To me, it would need to be a a, a smaller community, a tight knit community of, of good people, uh, a community that you can get to know people better and 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 develop, you know, those closer, longer term relationships. But you know, probably key for me is just being able to ride out from the house. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would love to be able to have the the experience that I seek on a mountain bike without having to get in my car first. Somehow that takes away from the overall experience, but just being able to go out and ride some really good trails straight out my door, uh, I think would be at the top of my list. That's top of my list too. Oh, okay. Good. Hopefully you've got that where you're at, Josh. I actually do have that where I'm at. Oh, good. 
It, I, have, I have about three miles of pavement before I hit dirt, but that's a perfect warm up. That ain't bad. That ain't bad at all. Nice. Honestly, we we have it pretty good here. I mean, it's we're surrounded by you know. I think last I looked, Colorado had nine thousand miles of trail. I mean, we we have it pretty good uh, here. Sixteen thousand, I think. Sixteen thousand. Okay, I got that number way off. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw that again recently. I think it was last week. Somebody had that number for us. Wow. If you if you talk to Tony Boone, he's going to tell you that you also have the highest concentration of trail builders. <laughs> not be surprised to that either. Yep. We uh we've done some great projects with Tony Boone for sure. Yeah, Tony's really proud of Colorado and he's really proud of all the builders that you guys have in in that state and so that's it's always good to I him and I at least message, you know, text message. I mean, lately it's been daily. <laughs> but it's pretty frequently so it's which is pretty awesome. You know, there's a lot of great trail builders and we we love good trail builders with good attitudes who work hard and do what they say that have good integrity. And so we're always on the lookout for, for someone we can partner with. I mean, when we built or shoot, Gary picked jagged ax just because they seem like the right, you know, builder for that particular trail. So we're on the lookout for, for great partners there. Yeah. Well, and- we'd, like to, we'd like to do some work with uh, your hat there, rock solid. My hat. That's, uh, <laughs> that's somebody that's on our list to to do a project with someday. Well, you might be talking to somebody that might be able to talk to somebody considering that's actually my employer. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. That's your day job? My day job is rock solid. Yes. Oh, right I didn't know that. That's fun. Didn't know that. Yeah. So the, the podcast is a side project that started before rock solid. Yeah, at least me or yeah, the podcast. Is, Rock Solid started before the podcast as a company. Me working at Rock Solid is more of a recent a recent thing. I started with Rock Solid in May of 2023. Before that, I had 27 years of government work with Wisconsin DOT. So, so fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I just thought it was uh, it was part of the gig here that whenever you interview somebody, we have to send you a hat. I was, oh. was going to say, Gary, I was, I was boxing up a hat straight after this interview, so. <laughs> Perfect. It's, you, guys have, cool. you guys have Chris trained well. <laughs> you know, let in with that and let us know you're you're in the business as well. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, I do. It is. I, I mean, I, I do do it separately, which is, you know, why yeah. we move this meeting because I have another meeting that's rock solid related after this meeting. But ironically, this podcast actually technically started with, with rock solid. It was. I've been friends with Aaron Rodgers um, since before the guy that started Rock Solid, since he was a club president for Copper Harbor Harold's Club before he even worked for AMBA. And I was doing this podcast, or I was doing a different podcast that was regional, and I you know, wanted to go national with it. And so I was literally driving to Copper Harbor during COVID as a trip to get away and came up with the idea on that drive and just got a hold of Aaron when I got up there. I'm like, hey, like, I'm going to start this new podcast. It's going to go hopefully national. That was the goal at the time. Do you want to kick off the first episode? And so like literally the first episode was recorded in the shop of Rock Solid in Copper Harbor. Well, that's great. That's a great wow. story. So is that, your, is that your place you would want to go to if you could had to move, wanted to move? Yeah, I, it's my favorite place to ride, for, especially for the upper Midwest. And I haven't, you know, I haven't been to a lot of places, but. It's pretty magical. There are, it does have challenges. Like it's only 90 people deep, you know, so it's pretty remote, but it's, I think it's as close to riding in what you consider like remote mountain biking, like real mountain biking that you can get in the upper Midwest. That's my opinion. Other people are going to say other communities like Mar- like Marquette or Duluth or whatever, but I think yeah. Copper Harbor is that place. Mm, that's great to hear. Cool. It's on my list of places to get to. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's good. It's just hard to get to because it's a dead end. Yeah, out in the middle of nowhere for sure. Yeah, yeah. Specifically, it's actually in the middle of Lake Superior, which I think surprised some people when they look at it on a map. It's like the dead end out in the middle of this monster lake. <laughs> <laughs> right. What we've done up at Maryland Mountain, or shoot double black, you know, extremely hard trail to, you know, last year, last spring when we opened Rutabaga Ride, you know, a nice, super fun blue trail that you know was hugely popular and you know like if you want to see more things like that then jump on board volunteer your time become a member and and help us grow this organization that's just going to grow the footprint of mountain biking here in the front range 
Or if you have a, a local business and you'd like to get involved with us and, and yes. uh, you know, either through member perks or through direct support, you know, corporate work days, you know, we're, we're always looking to find more of those, those local partners. Yeah. Well, Josh, if you need a job, just let me know. Come on out here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Come, come move, uh, come move dirt and rock in the Rockies. It's a, it's a unique experience. <laughs> yeah. Hey Josh, one other thing that that I would queue up for you that maybe uh, is a good topic for another um, you know podcast down the road, but uh, I'd like people to be more aware of the statewide coalition that we're also part of of creating. Colorado Mountain Bike Coalition here is um, mountain bike and trail advocacy orgs across the state. We have right around twenty member orgs, I think, at the moment. And what we're trying to do is to create more of the of what it sounds like Comba is, um, but that actual statewide voice for mountain bikers and and trail recreationists across the state. Uh, we have some some big conversations, <laughs> to put it lightly, here in Colorado, and the mountain bikers need a, a more unified voice in those conversations, particularly with our shared land managers at the state and national level. So there's there's an effort going on there over the last three or four years to bring that group up to speed and and to get them established. So uh, that's a another story in and of itself, but but something that's critical to the the future of riding here in Colorado. Yeah, I'd absolutely love to share that story. That's I've shared some more stories with uh, the Vermont, you know, the Vermont Mountain right. Bike Association, and with California, they have a they have a statewide coalition. I haven't been able to have. Uh, Evergreen on yet, which is the one in Washington. Um, yeah, yeah. Had Sorba on, which is like a seven state coalition. <laughs> Sorba, Sorba is similar and different at the same time. Yeah, but it's you know I think these statewide coalitions are super important for all the reasons you just said. It's especially when it comes to getting that state funding and letting the legislator legislators know and what what is happening at the state capital level. You know, and getting that conduit going free flowing between state organization or local organizations in the state. You know, state agencies. For sure. So it's that I, I welcome doing that. That's that story as well. Cool. well. Let us know. Well, it's Friday. That means we have a weekend ahead of us. Hopefully you all have <laughs> something going on. That's, that's interesting and fun. I really appreciate yeah. all of you taking the time with this and juggling, you know, different schedules and whatnot. Cause I, yeah. you know, it's, it's always tough to get everyone on the same page and we pulled it off. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of that. Yeah, we really appreciate the opportunity for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. It's good to meet you. For sure. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, please take the time to share these shows with others. Sharing these shows will help create awareness of both the guests who have taken the time to be on the show and the podcast series itself. Also, if you're new to the Trail Effect Podcast, check out our ever expanding library of episodes. If you listen to the Trail Effect Podcast on Apple or Spotify, please don't forget to leave a rating and review as this is one of the best ways to show your support for the Trail Effect podcast. Also, don't forget to check out Cooley Creative at www.dojustsendit.com. For additional ways to help support the Trail Effect podcast, check out the affiliate links tab at the Trail Effect website, where you'll find links to Kettle Mountain Apparel, Worldwide Cyclery, and Trail One Components. By using the affiliate links found at www.traileffectpodcast.com, a small commission will come back to the podcast, which will help keep this thing going. This podcast has been edited and produced by Evolution Trail Services. Thank you again for listening.